Well, good morning. Um, I want to kind of tag on to what Tom said about our technology. You know, we have several different ways of connecting that uh, I really want you to, to really think about and be aware of. We do have uh, the Camelback Family uh, Facebook page. We have the Camelback Church of Christ Facebook page. We have camelbackchurchofchrist.org is our website. We have Camelback Radio that you can log on to. And we have Camelback Church of Christ YouTube channel. So thankfully through technology, we have a lot of ways that we can stay connected. And y'all, we also have telephones. So let's call each other. Let's talk to each other. Let's check in with each other. And just spend a little time throughout your day. It doesn't take a long time. And let's face it, who doesn't have time on their hands right now that we couldn't pick up our phone and call somebody and check on them and just let them know that someone's thinking about them. So thankfully, through technology, we have a lot of ways that we, we can stay connected. Now, last week, we talked about worship and, and how worship has a lot of different avenues and a lot of different dimensions. And so um, the elders asked me, could I ex expand on that a little bit this week and take that just a little bit farther? So today we're going to talk about worship again, but I want to start by telling you, um, this year makes 23 years that I have been preaching, which is amazing to me that that's the case, but 23 years. And in those 23 years, as any preacher will tell you, they've had a lot of um, varied responses and experiences following the close of a service. Some are very encouraging, some are very uplifting, and others are, are different. They're not as encouraging or uplifting. So I want to share with you one that, that happened where... We had a, a, a service that was, had concluded. People were leaving. People were walking out. And there was one particular member who had stayed behind, just kind of hanging around, just waiting, looking like there was something on their mind. So after everybody had, had left, just about, this dear sister, a wonderful, sweet, godly woman, came to me and said, I did not get anything out of the worship service today. Okay. Uh, she said, the singing was just dreadful, and the lesson did not build me up or encourage me at all. And, and she just went on this rant about all these things. Well, at that time in my preaching career, I took this very much to heart because... It, 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 and it burdened me that I had this response from this member that was not encouraged and built up by the worship service. Well, now, where I am at this point, I would have had a much different response. I would have still have responded in love and compassion, but would have been entirely different because... The first time around, like, well, what can we do better? How can we improve? What can we... Now it would be, so, so let me understand this correctly. Your worship experience is solely dependent upon someone else and not you. Is that, is that what you're trying to tell me? If I don't deliver a, a, a powerful sermon then you don't get to worship. If the song leader doesn't do a great job with some wonderful upbeat songs, then you don't get to worship. If the guy leading the prayer just rambles on and on and on, then you don't get to worship. And if the person doing the reading doesn't read clearly and forcefully, then you don't have the opportunity to worship. So what you're saying is, is your ability to worship is entirely dependent upon someone else's ability to lead it. Is that what you're saying? I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm clear about this. Because let's be truthful and honest about this, folks. 
Our ability to worship effectively does not rely on anyone else, anywhere else. Our ability to effectively worship depends on two things. Our attitude toward God and our willingness to worship Him. That's it. Those are the only two things that matter. Because if we come in with the attitude of I'm going to worship no matter what, then we can. But here's the bigger issue. The one that, 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 really, that really struck me as I, the more I thought about this was when someone says, I didn't get anything out of the worship today or I didn't feel like I was built up or encouraged, then what you're actually saying is, look, I had one hour to worship today and you completely wasted that hour for me. That's really what it says when you say, I didn't get anything out of the worship. Look, I spent my one hour at worship and it was wasted because of your horrible lesson, the, the singing. What, you know, that is not what our worship is. Now, I, I told Laura earlier that I'm gonna, I may have to take a nap after I use this phrase because it's a big one. We have created in our worship liturgical atrophy. Anybody know what liturgical atrophy might be? The liturgy is, by definition, the form or formula used by a Christian congregate, by a Christian group to formulate their worship. It's a, a formula that determines the style and direction of worship. In other words, our liturgy is all explained right there on the order of worship that says, here's what's going to happen. So we have condensed our worship experience, our relationship with God, everything that we are about that relationship with Him, we have condensed it down to that list of things that we do that are worship. From the announcements to the closing prayer, everything has to be in order. I have actually had someone say to me, we have to have that so we'll know what's coming next. You know, last week we talked about the program, how you look at the program and you know what's coming. Now, we, I fear we have reduced our worship service to that one hour with a formulated plan of this is what's going to happen. And then when this is done, it's over. And so we've taken our relationship with God, our worship of Him, and boxed it and packaged it in a way that makes us think once we sit, we start our worship. Once we leave, we end our worship. And you know, I'm just going to tell you, we have created a worship environment that is dictated by date, time, and location. We, that's what we've created. And so as we look at some things together today, I want us to look outside that box and outside the confines of a worship service and create in our minds a worship life because a worship life is one that's going to be pleasing to God. So, and interestingly enough, last week I had a particular scripture in mind that I was going to use, and then I thought, well, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to go there today. And then after we were done, Mark and Tom and I were talking, and Mark said, you know a good verse that would have been good to use there? And it was the one that I had thought about and didn't use. So today we're going to go there and look at that for just a minute. And it's in Romans chapter 12, and it's verse 1. And it's a very familiar verse to most of us. Where Paul writes there, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And the New King James says, which is your reasonable service. We present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, 
which is your reasonable service. Now, the NIV translates that, which is your true and proper worship. Now, the English Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, and the New Revised Standard Version call it your spiritual worship, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. And the New Living Translation um, translates it as truly the way to worship. So if you read it that way, it is present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is truly the way to worship. I, I like that approach. You know, this is, this is how you worship God. You present yourself to Him holy and acceptable. But then we think, well, how can we do that? Because we're, we're, we're not holy. And on our own, we are entirely unacceptable because if we think about the sacrifices that, were, that God required, the, one of the main requirements was that that sacrifice be spotless, without blemish. And so if I want to present myself to God, a living sacrifice, then I have to present myself to Him spotless and without blemish. But y'all, I'm just going to tell you, I'm blemished. You know, I'm, I'm, I've got some things, but look at this. How do we become acceptable and spotless without blemish? Remember back in John 13, when Jesus is, is uh, with his disciples and he's washing their feet. And Peter says, oh, no, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, well, unless I wash you. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wash you, yeah. Well, then Peter says, well, then wash all of me. Because Jesus says, unless I wash you, you can have no part of me. Now, the, the way that we present ourselves to God, spotless and without blemish, is through the blood of Jesus Christ that makes us spotless without blemish. That's what creates the difference. And so when we are willing to submit to that and allow ourselves to be washed in that blood, then we stand before God spotless and unblemished and can present ourselves this living sacrifice, which is the true way to worship God. Now, if you look at what it says there, it doesn't say anything about an order of worship. It doesn't say anything about a place of worship. It doesn't say anything about a time of worship or a date for the worship or a day for the worship. It says you present your bodies to God, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is the true way to worship. And so it doesn't say be holy and acceptable on Sunday morning. It doesn't say be holy and acceptable at, at a particular time. It says be holy and acceptable. And it doesn't give any other specifications about when, where, or how. And so when we look at it this way, our reasonable service, our spiritual worship to God is being able to come, come to Him through Christ, holy and acceptable, in submission to Him and obedience to Him. Because Jesus said, you remember, He said, if, if you love me, you will keep my commandments in John 14. If you do these things, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. So there are some requirements that we have to meet to be holy and acceptable and to have this avenue of worship with God that is constant all day, every day. So look at what Paul says as we go down here in, in Romans 12. He's talking about the, the many members but one body, you know, and it's hard to think about now in the situation that we're in. We, we've got a little bit of difficulty because we can't be together in one place. Physically together in one place. But we are together in spirit, in one body, many members, and so each of us has a different gift. You know, you may have the gift of the card sending. You may have the gift of technology. You may have the gift of of calling people. You may have the gift of going and, and, and checking on someone or buying them some groceries and taking it to them. You may, whatever your gift is, use that gift. And that is part of our worship to God. It's not just sitting here together, but our lives that show 
our relationship with God, our lives that show Jesus to the world are part of our worship. So, if you prophesy, then prophesy. If you're ministry, then use your ministry. If you teach, then teach. If you exhort, then you exhort. If you give, give liberally. If you lead, lead with diligence. If you show mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Love without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. All these things that we do are worship to God in a maybe in an abstract kind of a way because it's not what we think of as worship as we've been trained over generations. Let's face it, we've been, we, many of us have been trained over generations that when we look at that list, that is our worship. And folks, our worship goes so far beyond the list even far beyond this list. Matter of fact, if you look back, look back at, at uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount, I, I love this. This is just, this is what Jesus told the people who were following him. Now I'm going to paraphrase a lot of this because I'm going to put it in terms that I would use. Not that I can improve on the words of the Holy Spirit, but this is what I would say. You should be poor in spirit. You should mourn. You should be meek. You should hunger and thirst after righteousness. You should be merciful. You should be pure in heart. You should be peacemakers. You're going to be persecuted for righteousness' sake if you really seek me. You're going to be persecuted and people are going to do all kinds of bad things to you. But rejoice in that. Be happy in that. You're the salt of the earth. Use that salt. You're a light on a hill, let your light shine. Be sexually pure. Don't be mad at your brother. Be honest. Don't be vengeful. Give to those who ask you. Don't turn them away. And don't just love your neighbor, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you and do good to people who hate you. Pray for those people who are mean to you. Do charitable deeds and don't worry about who gets the credit. Pray, but don't make a big show out of it. Forgive people. See, this list goes on and on and on. And, and don't worry. God's got you taken care of. Seek His kingdom. Don't judge people. Don't follow the crowd down the wide way, but, but go down the narrow way because that leads to life. Bear good fruit. And don't just say to me, Lord, but then if you call me Lord, then act like I'm your Lord. Obey me like I'm your Lord. These are the things that Jesus says, these are the way you show the world that I am your Lord, by doing these things. And, if, and we, the, the list goes on and on and on. So we can look at all these other ways of worship that don't involve sitting in a pew at 1030 on Sunday morning. Because how many of you this morning are not sitting in a pew at 1030 on Sunday morning, and yet we are still worshiping together. And did you realize that when you sent me that card this past week, and you know who you are, that you were worshiping? When you call someone and tell them, I miss you and I love you, you are glorifying God. When you spend time and effort 
putting together a, a video or an audio or whatever it is you're doing to help encourage someone. You're honoring and glorifying our Father. You know, we don't need to, to just wrap it up in a neat little package. Worship doesn't need to be an event. It needs to be who we are. Now, we have taken nothing away, folks, taken nothing away from the blessing of being together. And we know by being forced to be apart, many of us are realizing what a blessing it is to actually be able to be together and to do those things together, to be able to, to sing together and pray together and to study together and do all those elements that are those physical elements that, uh, that create our spiritual worship together. Those are wonderful, but we cannot confine our worship to a service time. And so as we look at these lists and look at these things that, that Jesus has said and the Holy Spirit ha has led the, the New Testament writers to say, look, there is, there is so much more to our relationship and our responsibility to God than just the hour of service. We need to develop the attitude of a life of service. That our worship doesn't start and stop. It is just a continual way of life for us. And wherever we are, whenever we are, and whoever we're with, we need to have an attitude of worship. Glorifying God honoring him no matter what so the simple things i mentioned a few last week paying for the person behind you in the drive-thru letting you know how many times have you been in the line at the grocery store and there's somebody in front of you with two buggy full of of food and you've got a loaf of bread and you think well wouldn't it be nice if they let me go in front and sometimes they do i always do if I, somebody walks up behind me and i've got a buggy load then and they're going to go in front of me. And you know what? That, that might be the only act of kindness they see that day. Simple acts of kindness. Letting our lights shine so that the world can see our Father and glorify Him. Church, that is worship. No matter where we are. And when we pray, it can be Driving down the road, that's honoring God. Don't pray with your eyes closed driving down the road. That would not be the best move to make. But how many of us sing throughout the day? <laughs> I sing all the time, or hum, or whistle, but I've always got something. It, and that's honoring God when we're thinking about Him and show that connection to Him. And not just here, but everywhere. Worship is a way of life. And when we are able to let worship transcend and, and, and move from what we have confined it to, to what God wants it to be, then I won't be relying on you for my worship experience and you won't be relying on me for yours, we will simply have this relationship with God that says to him, God, I honor you, I glorify you, I worship you in everything I do. I pray that that is where we go in this body, collectively and individually, and realize that our purpose together is to glorify and honor and worship our Father. Now, a wonderful byproduct, a byproduct of that is that we are encouraged, we're built up, we are edified. But our purpose in being here, our purpose in worship is to honor Him. And I pray that we can get a good, clear sense that when we present ourselves to God, 
a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, because that is the way we truly worship. Have a good day.